In the previous hour, brethren, I sought to both persuade your judgment and I hope in some measure educate, maybe a better word would be attack your conscience, regarding the principle that I expressed in these words that you must seek to attain and maintain an accurate understanding of your present physical and emotional constitution and engage in a regular but flexible discipline aimed at keeping these two aspects of your redeemed humanity in optimum health and vigor. In this hour, it's my purpose to exegete that principle as stated and to give from very specific and practical applications of it. However, if you men have any acquaintance with the actings of your own remaining sin, and I'm assuming you do, you know very well that there is always a fibrous strain of indisposition in our hearts towards our revealed duty. And so at the beginning of this lecture, we need to pray in the words of the psalmist, Psalm 119 and verse 36, incline my heart unto your testimonies. David was conscious that though he loved the testimonies of God, and though the prevailing disposition of his heart was towards obedience to those testimonies, there was always a disinclination in another direction. The language of Paul from Romans 7, when I would do good, evil is present with me. So let's plead with God that he will incline our hearts unto his testimonies in this very crucial aspect of our duty in seeking to be men of God who are concerned about our physical and emotional constitution that we might render optimum service and be useful in Christ's kingdom. Let's pray together. Our Father, we confess with shame the reality of that remaining corruption that constantly surfaces in this disinclination to run in the way of your commandments. And we pray that by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit, you would incline our hearts unto your testimonies. You who have done that, has done that great work of taking out the heart of stone, giving us a heart of flesh, giving to us your Holy Spirit, writing your law upon our hearts so that as renewed men we can say, we delight to do your will, O God. Yes, your law is within our hearts, but we acknowledge the reality of that other principle and pray that by your grace it would be overcome and subdued and that we may find ourselves running in the way of your commandments. Bless our study together then in this hour we plead through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Having set before you in the previous hour the five reasons as to why this subject in my judgment ought to be included in any responsible course in pastoral theology. What I want to do in this hour is to explain the significant words in that axiom or principle as stated, and then to make a number of concrete applications by way of warnings and exhortations. When I have stated that we must seek to attain and to maintain an accurate understanding of our present physical and emotional constitution. What do I have in mind by those words? Well, simply this, that in the light of the biblical doctrine of creation, particularly as it is delineated in passages such as Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16, or Job 10, 8 to 12, 
It is God who knit us together in our mother's wombs. But he didn't knit us all together in the same way. And so some, by virtue of genes and early training, have naturally strong, vigorous constitutions. Others, naturally weak and susceptible to all kinds of ills. Likewise, some have been knit together in their mother's wombs, trained in their periods of development, so that we can say of them, they have great emotional strength and resilience. Others are relatively emotionally weak. It doesn't take much pressure for them to become unstrung in their emotional fabric. Now, this reality is what is, and God is the Lord of that reality, and we need to face it, face it now, and continually face it, because it is not static. It is constantly changing. And in the light of the exhortation of Romans 12.3, which focuses primarily on a sober self-assessment of our giftedness by the will of Christ, yet that sober self-assessment should reach out into these areas of seeking to ascertain with some degree of accuracy, and that's why I've said to maintain, to attain, and to maintain an accurate assessment of who and what we are, both physically and emotionally. I say it's not static. Second Corinthians 4:16 reminds us that the outward man is perishing. That means that the measure of physical resilience one had at 30 is unlikely he's to have at 40. And likewise, it is true with the emotional constitution. One of the things that I've had to come to grips with in the past couple of years, and it has contributed to the decision to consider relinquishing the place of prominent leadership I've had for years in this assembly, is not only all of the undeniable evidences of uh, attrition and diminution of physical strength, but particularly emotional strength. I find at this stage in my life that when we face the kinds of pastoral issues that have tremendous emotional pressure, I feel the same kind of weakness that I felt after the lengthy trial with my wife's illness and her ultimate death. The lightheadedness, uh, the sense of, I don't know how else to explain it, as though someone has opened the petcock at the bottom of the radiator and all the antifreeze and coolant is gone out. And I realize that in this situation of Trinity Church with its manifold stewardships and the things attendant upon a ministry here, it is not right that the people of God have a man in leadership who is not emotionally strong and emotionally resilient. We find that incident in 2 Samuel 21, 17, very interesting with respect to David and his physical ability to be a warrior. Verse 15 of 2 Samuel 21, I read, And the Philistines had war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him. At least he'd learned his lesson to stay back at Jerusalem while my troops go out to fight is to leave myself vulnerable to sin. Thank God he seemed to learn that lesson. However, we read that as he went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, that David waxed faint. And Ishbi Benob, who was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of brass in weight, and being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore unto him, saying, You shall go no more out with us to battle that you quench not the lamp of Israel. There comes a time when David's sword got heavy too soon, when that millisecond of reflexive response in battle, he lost it. 
like the prize fighter who won't face the fact he's lost it where milliseconds of response to the feint and to, and to the jab and to the thrust and to the left hook of the fighter is such that no longer are his responses such that he ought to enter the ring. Well, we need to face realistically, not in a way of coddling ourselves, but an honest, sober assessment of where we are in our physical and emotional strength. The second area of concern that I address in that axiom has to do with establishing a structure of activities, relationships, both personal, domestic, and ministerially, which will, with the blessing of God, maintain us at optimum physical and emotional strength and vigor. When we pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. If those prayers are sincere, then we do all within our power to put ourselves in the way of their answer. Our prayers are hypocritical that we be led not into temptation if we then deliberately and willfully place our feet, our hands, our eyes, our ears in a way of temptation. If indeed we are praying to be delivered from the evil one, then we will both watch as well as pray. We will flee the occasions of sin. Well, likewise, when we are committed by the grace of God that we will serve God with optimum physical and emotional strength, then we will be prepared to do what we ought to do in establishing a structure of activities and relationships personally, domestically, and ministerially that will contribute to that optimum strength and vigor, both physically and emotionally. Now granted, God calls us to submit to the unexplained and the unexpected intrusions into our physical health and our emotional strength. 2 Corinthians 12, which has again in recent days been my meat and drink. God allows the evil one or God by other means brings us into a place of unexpected and undesired weakness. Weakness, which like Paul's thorn, we think is an impediment to our fulfilling the will of God for us. When Paul says, for this thing I sought the Lord three times that it might depart from me, I have no question that his primary motive was not his own convenience or his own comfort. A man who had experienced so much in the way of physical and emotional discomfort in the cause of Christ, but that he saw this thorn in the flesh as an impediment to fulfilling the purpose of God for him as an apostle. So he prays that it might be removed. And then the Lord says, no, there's another element in the equation, Paul. And the element is this. I can, by intenting you, the sense of that verb, by spreading like a tent over you the power of my Son, while you are yet in this state of conscious weakness, I can use a weak man, intenting him by my power, but I can't use a proud man. Lest then I should be exalted over much in the light of the abundant of revelations, there was given to me this messenger of Satan, this thorn in the flesh. And so Paul then says, Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. When I am weak, then I am strong. The psalmist could say in Psalm 102 and verse 23, He weakened my strength in the way. And so I'm not ignorant, either from the scriptures or my own experience, that God does bring upon us unexplained, unexpected intrusions that weaken us physically, that utterly drain us and enervate us emotionally. However, 
in the light of the overall teaching of the Word of God, I believe the Scriptures teach us that we have a responsibility to seek to establish a structure of activity and relationships that will most likely, with God's blessing, contribute to our physical and emotional health and vigor. And then the final area of concern that I address in that axiom is that which keeps in focus that you and I are redeemed sinners, purchased by the blood of Christ and indwelt by the Spirit of God, the redemptive property of another. And that has profound implications for this matter of seeking optimum physical and emotional health and vigor. I am the property of another, and I have a responsibility to conduct myself in all the areas of my life with that consciousness. In the 1 Corinthians 6 passage, the primary focus there is sexual purity. And the apostle is saying, if you Corinthians can get hold of this truth, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You are God's purchased possession, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which is his. And I know of no truth that more profoundly influences at the practical level my own thinking and I trust my practice than that reality. I am blood bought property. This body is the very temple, the sanctuary of God the Holy Spirit. And I should seek to do all within my power that that temple is in good order that God be glorified and his purposes accomplished through me. Well, having sought to demonstrate the necessity of this concern along those five lines of the previous hour, having asserted and given a brief explanation of the significance of the words of the axiom, now we come thirdly to the practical directives for the implementation of these concerns. Now, granted, I'm conscious there is some overlap and interpenetration, but nonetheless, I want to address this matter, this heading, in two basic subheadings, those directives pertaining to our physical health and those pertaining to our emotional health. And here, I couch them in the form of warnings. And let me just do a little aside and say I have never understood Christians who are irritated by warnings. I've never seen anyone stop his car by a dangerous curve and get out and start cussing the police or whoever put up a sign saying, warning, dangerous curve ahead. I've never seen anyone take a bottle that had some toxic material and had the crossbones on it saying, warning, do not drink deadly and throw it down and stomp on it and say, I'm insulted that you think I need warnings. The scripture tells us that it is by God's precepts, moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in the keeping of them there is great reward. So believing you men have more sense than to be irritated by warnings, I believe I am speaking to men who will welcome gracious warnings for your own well-being. Warning number one with regard to your physical health. Beware of fundamental ignorance of or indifference to the basics of health and nutrition. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, how can I, how can you be conscious of obeying that injunction, eating, drinking to the glory of God, if we are willfully ignorant or indifferent concerning that which God has made known concerning what we should eat and what we should drink, 
how much we should eat and how much we should drink, how can we consciously say, O oh God, I am seeking to eat and drink to your glory, though I am blissfully and willfully ignorant of what foods will do me good and nourish me, what foods may harm me, what drinks may nourish me and strengthen me and contribute to physical health and vigor, what drinks will militate against, but Lord, I'm eating and drinking to your glory. You simply can't do it, my brethren. You cannot do it. The preacher who loads his system with excessive salt, excessive amounts of caffeine, whether in his coffee, his tea, or his soft drinks, and then has high blood pressure, setting himself up for a stroke, he is not eating to the glory of God. He's eating to the destruction and harm of a blood-bought temple of the Holy Ghost. Now that's blunt language, brethren, but I am not fearful that I can be challenged on scriptural grounds. It is a fact that excessive imbibing of salt and caffeine in combination are great contributors to high blood pressure and the high blood pressure to other physical maladies, some of them deadly. Well, I just don't read the articles. Willful ignorance does not exempt from culpability. Now, I am not making a plea for body worship. I am not making a plea for that overfastidiousness in which someone reads the label on everything from a cracker to a crumb. And if there is one little ingredient there that is not organically raised and all the rest, they're ready to pronounce a curse on it. My brethren, let all things be done in moderation. I have no sympathy for that kind of nonsense. Go to the library. If you can't afford to get a couple of good books, responsible books, on what the body needs in the way of balanced nutritional diet, what things are helpful and contribute to the overall vigor and health of your body, what things are least likely to contribute to setting yourself up for these diseases that ravage millions in our own country. So I urge you, my brothers, beware of fundamental ignorance, a willful fundamental ignorance of or indifference to the basics of health and nutrition. Now, secondly, and here I stick my neck out, but that's all right. I believe I've got grounds to do so. Beware of excessive weight accumulation. Although this exhortation could properly be ranged under the first, it is important enough to give this higher profile by a distinct heading. As a general rule, ministerial fat and maximum ministerial usefulness are incompatible as a general rule. Ah, oh, but look at so-and-so. He was grossly overweight and greatly used of God. Yes, he may have been. To his own master, he stands or he falls. But the sin of another is not the justification for my sin. How do we know what years some of the men of God of the past might have had of greater usefulness had they had a conscience about this matter. Now why? Why is excessive weight accumulation ordinarily that which erodes ministerial usefulness? I've listed three reasons for you in your notes. First of all, the sluggishness produced by excessive weight. The strain upon your heart to pump blood through that extra flesh the inability to throw yourself into preaching without puffing and wheezing like an old pack mule. I've seen some men that when they got a holy fit in preaching and there was something of the fire and the energy of their souls, it had to break through so much fat that they almost undid by that what they were seeking 
to say. The sluggishness produced by excessive weight gain. Secondly, the crippling effect of a guilty conscience. I have yet to meet a preacher who is grossly and perpetually overweight, who if he's honest with me, doesn't tell me his conscience smites him continually. Well, the Bible says the way of him that is laden with guilt is exceedingly crooked. Now, I know it isn't fair. A man can be secretly feeding his soul upon the foul, noxious, devilish filth of internet pornography and nobody know but him and God for a while. I know that. If a man's feeding on too many calories, everybody knows. It shows right here. It ain't fair. I know, but that's reality. That's reality. And it has a crippling effect upon a man because his conscience smites him. He can't deny what he sees when he looks in the mirror, when he tightens his belt. That's reality. And brethren, if we're committed to maintain a conscience void of offense to God and to man. For some of us, one of the most sensitive areas in the maintenance of that conscience is what the scales tell us. I love the scales. They don't listen to my rationalization. They don't listen to my argumentation. They just look up at me and tell me the truth. 187, 190, 190. I say, hey, come on now. Just shave the truth a little bit, won't you? Because when you tell me the truth, and the truth means that I've got to say no to that thing and this thing and that thing over the next three weeks to get my weight within the framework that from all that I can discern from medical knowledge and from experience is a healthy weight, Mr. Scale, give me a little slack. And he looks up at me and smiles and said, I'm committed to tell you the truth. My brothers, I urge you, beware of excessive weight accumulation. It produces sluggishness in our overall performance level the crippling effect of a guilty conscience, and thirdly, the loss of grip upon the consciences of others. How can we be blameless as self-controlled, 1 Timothy 3, 2, when what we carry on our bellies screams to our people, I don't have control over my fingers at the table. Now, come on, brethren, get honest with me. How can we project blamelessness in the area of self-control if there is the continual visual declaration to our people, I don't have control over my belly? Brothers, this may sound hard. But in this area, anything that touches our physical appetites, we've got to become ruthless. That's why Paul said, I keep under my body with that vigorous verb, I bruise it till black and blue. And it is. And that's why the whole concept of mortification at times is grossly brutal and ugly, whacking off hands and gouging out eyes and casting them from us. It's a terrible thing to lose a grip on the consciences of your people. How can you say to your people, be followers of me as I am of Christ? How can you say, that I'm seeking to be obedient to the injunction of 2 Corinthians 6, 3, in nothing giving offense, that the ministry be not blamed. My brothers, if you have a struggle in this area, you have got to do whatever you must do responsibly to get a handle on this issue to the glory of God that you might be optimally strong and vigorous and energetic to serve him, that you might have a conscience void of offense to God, and you might have a grip upon the conscience of others. My third 
line of exhortation in the way of warning to beware of willful and ongoing ignorance, beware of excessive weight gain. Now thirdly, beware of the no planned physical exercise syndrome. The no planned physical exercise syndrome. Our technological age has made much of the normal, ordinary physical activity of a bygone day outmoded and obsolete. You read some of the old, like we read De Porter. He said, I went back to, I think he said he went back even behind the plow and to splitting wood and to horseback riding. Uh, things that an ordinary man might do in the course of his ordinary life. We have, with our technology, uh, produced a very sedentary lifestyle. And the nature of our work brings maximum mental and emotional strain with a minimum of vigorous physical activity, except for some of us, in the way that we preach. Now, in the light of this, ministers are prime candidates for the results of no vigorous cardiovascular exercise. Exercise that makes the heart pump and causes the blood to surge through the entire circulatory system. 1 Timothy 4.8, bodily exercise is profitable for little. And just like a man 50 years ago could have said, well, there's no reason why I can't enjoy my cigars or my cigarettes and inhale them. It's a liberty. God's given us all things richly to enjoy. And when you read of Thornwell's love of good cigars, it's a, it's a very fascinating essay in, in one of the volumes of the works of Thornwell. Uh, he loved expensive clothing for his suits, and he loved high-class cigars. And you know there are all kinds of, uh, what shall I say, I don't know whether there, any of them have substance to them about Spurgeon and his cigars, but in the light of the medical data, I don't believe any man can say, I can use tobacco with some degree of regularity and inhale it to the glory of God. The connection between tobacco and heart disease and lung disease is undeniable. It's a violation of the sixth commandment. Now, if there's somebody who occasionally would find it relaxing to take a cigar, not inhale it, and puff it out on his back porch, I'm not ready to promote his excommunication. Uh, frankly, I just would question his sanity. Uh, those stinking, uh, acidy tasting things, I mean, I frankly don't know how in the world any normal human being could enjoy it. But if some guy says, yes, no, no, I, I'm not going back into a fundamentalist, legalistic perspective. But brethren, the evidence is too clear. Likewise, the evidence of the connection between some regular, planned, we're not talking about having to go out and pump iron and having to do something that is unusually vigorous, just 20 minutes to a half an hour of a brisk walk every day. At the end of the day, all that I read in my medical newsletters keeps coming back and emphasizing the same thing. If our society would give itself just to that measure, five days a week, the degree of the declension of heart disease and, and heart uh, uh, occlusion of arteries and all of the rest, brethren, I urge you, not telling you what kind of exercise, where and how much, establish a plan and do it now whether walking, jogging, swimming, whatever it is, something in which you consciously say, Lord, you made the body in such a way that it functions best when it undergoes some element of this stress upon the cardiovascular system. And in the light of the intrusion of sin and its effect upon the total physiology, Lord, how much more there is a need. Now, if you need to read a book on aerobics, if you need to listen to my tapes in the four Sunday school lessons I did on the Christian and the stewardship of his body, I have sought in those tapes to give what I hope is the fruit of years of thinking this thing through, establishing a theology 
of the Christian and his body, and then built on that theology councils concerning the stewardship of our body. But my brothers, please, I beg of you, don't treat this as an Al Martin hobby horse. This is not a hobby horse. I believe it grows out of a biblical perspective of what our bodies are and what it means to glorify God in them. Well, then we come in the fourth place to this fourth warning. Beware of the pattern of cheating on your necessary measure of sleep. Now, I'm aware that the Bible is unsparing in its castigation of the sleep lover, of the sluggard. Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 11, Go to the ant, you sluggard. You lazy guy, push your sheets off and find a little anthill somewhere and sit down with a notebook and learn from the ant. Learn from the ant and his industriousness. I'm fully aware of that. Furthermore, the Bible has a doctrine of self-denial. And sometimes self-denial impinges upon the measure of our sleep. The Lord said to the three in the garden, Matthew 26 and verse, I think it's 40. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? It was late at night. It was ordinary sleep time. Yet our Lord castigates them that they were sleeping when they ought to have been watching with him. And that's why Paul could say, in watchings oft, as well as in fastings oft, I'm aware of the biblical doctrine that castigates the sluggard, the biblical doctrine of self-denial that calls us at times to yield up the ordinary measure of sleep for the higher interest of the kingdom. However, the same Bible teaches us the truth of Psalm 127 and verse 2. It's the picture of the man that's cheating on his sleep because he believes it is necessary in order to make provision for himself and his family. It is vain for you to rise up early, to take rest late, to eat the bread of toil, for so he gives unto his beloved literally in sleep. God can give while you're sleeping the things that you think can only be attained when you are awake and cheating on a legitimate measure of sleep. And while the Bible is silent about so many details of the earthly life of our Lord, and periodically, I'm sure, you with me, you come across things, you say, well, I, I just wish the Bible gave us some record. How did Jesus do that? How did Jesus respond to this or that? But it does give us this detail by comparing Mark 4.35 with Luke 8.22. Jesus unashamedly took a nap in the late afternoon, and he did it in front of all his disciples, in a boat. I know some men, they're sort of reluctant to ever tell anyone they take a nap, like that somehow uh, go into the local bar or something. No. For some of us, an afternoon nap is a great means of grace for the restoration of our vigor in order to live out the day and not quit at six or seven, but still be productive till 10 or 11 o'clock in the evening. So the necessity for a realistic cycle of sleep and work is part of our creaturehood, not our sinnerhood. Day and night are not going to be part of the new creation, but they were of the original creation. And if you want a wonderful picture of what sleep was and what uh, marital bliss was, uh, read Milton's Paradise Lost and read the section of the first night in Eden with Adam and Eve lying down to sleep together. It's beautiful stuff. I went years and never read Milton, and when I read that stuff, I got hooked on Milton for a few weeks. I, I drove Marilyn crazy. I'd find her different places in the house and say, Honey, you've got to listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. But a beautiful picture of the sanctity 
of the God-given blessing of sleep. Remember what God did to his servant Elijah. He was all messed up. This painted witch called Jezebel, she just verbally sends out the notice that she's going to get him. And the guy who stood before all the false prophets, he's shaking like a leaf. He's got a death wish. He's in bad shape. What's the Lord do? He doesn't take him immediately out to a cave and start to get to his conscience. He says, my child is all messed up. He's lost sleep. There's been tremendous heat going over the wires of his emotional constitution. I'm going to feed him and put him to sleep. That's what God did. Now, it doesn't sound very spiritual, but that's what God did. That's what my Bible tells me God did. Put him to sleep and fed him, woke him up, fed him some more, and then he gets him out into a cave and he begins to show him. Now that through sleep he's been refreshed and through rest the emotional wires have cooled down so that he can begin to think rationally, God begins to deal with him and show him, oh, my servant Elijah, your perception of reality is not the measure of reality. You think you are the only one left. I know what I've done. I've reserved 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now you just get on your way. I've got more work for you to do. And what's he do then? He runs more to the marathon <laughs> in the strength that the Lord gives him. Some of it supernatural, some of it derived from God's R&R &R by putting him to sleep and feeding him. So, my brothers, beware of the cheat sleep syndrome. Then fifthly, beware of dependence upon addiction or addiction to stimulants or depressants. When the Bible says every creation of God is good and nothing to be refused, 1 Timothy 4, 4 and 5, it's speaking of food and drinks, including drinks that have caffeine in them. Yes, I believe drinks with caffeine are a gift of God. If not, I thank God for my morning cup of coffee sinfully many, many, many times. I was telling someone yesterday, I remember the days when I could put my feet on the floor from my bed, walk out in the hallway, up the half flight of stairs, right into my study upstairs, get on my knees with my Bible at my prayer chair, and begin to read and pray. If I try to do that now, forget it. Not only can I not read my Bible on my knees because I was getting a terrible crick in my neck with my bifocals. You try to read your Bible on your knees with bifocals. So I can't read my Bible on my knees anymore because part of the outward man decaying is the eyeballs that need bifocals to see right. And if I try to go straight from the bed to the prayer chair without going by the kitchen and pushing the button on the coffee maker and getting some caffeine to my brain, forget it. So I thank God for the gift of caffeine. But I don't thank God for caffeine any time after 6 o'clock at night because I'm going to be tossing and turning. And every once in a while I say, oh, it's all in your head, and someone will have some coffee after a lovely meal, and I break down and have a half a cup of coffee, and there I'm sitting lying there in bed, 12 o'clock, 12.30, 1 o'clock, and then I make something close to a vow. Lord, never again, never again, <laughs> never again. Well... Beware, my brethren, though, of becoming dependent upon or addicted to these things that are gifts of God, stimulants, depressants. There may be times when you're passing through an unusually intense crucible of emotional pressure where a proven sleeping tablet may be a gift of God. Some melatonin may be helpful. But beware of dependence upon or addiction to Remember what Paul said, meats for the belly, belly for meats, I will not be brought under the power of any. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and 13, you are Christ's free man. Don't allow yourself to become a slave to any of his gifts. And then I press on to say, beware of the no day off pattern of life. Beware of the no day off pattern of life. Listen to the words of Murphy, page 104, and your printed notes. 
we would earnestly recommend that Monday be observed as a day of mental and bodily rest. The minister must have his resting day as well as other men, or he'll suffer the consequences. His physical constitution demands it. If it is denied in time, he will break down in health, as hundreds are doing. Nor must it be supposed that devoting one day of the week to absolute rest will be a loss of time in the end. No, the work of the other days will be more vigorous. The physical and mental tone will be kept up. And at the end of the year, far more will be accomplished. One day of wakeful, energetic work is worth three or four spent in half-dreaming and forcing oneself to unattractive tasks. The principle of Sabbath rest. We are called upon His new covenant servants of God to labor on that appointed day. We don't have the physical, emotional rest. We have rest in God and rest in the worship of God and invigoration of our souls. But it takes a toll upon us. And if we try to live as though we are exempt from the principle of Sabbath rest as it touches physical and emotional refreshment, we will eventually suffer for it. Then, number seven, beware of the no planned vacation pattern of life. And here I must confess failure in my earlier years. I won't go into the details of it, but I just allowed myself to become a prisoner to the needs and the opportunities to serve Christ. And I believe that I not only cheated my family, but in some ways cheated my own well-being. Jesus said in Mark 6, 31, come apart and rest a while. Now I know in the context, it was shortly after pursuing this rest a while that multitudes follow, Jesus sees them and comes out to minister to them. I understand that. But the principle is nonetheless valid. Jesus unashamedly said to his disciples, there is the necessity for periods of resting a while. And then I'm going to say something that I hope doesn't shock you, but I believe we need to take into consideration as we think of our Lord as our pattern. He knew as a vigorous, strong, 30-year-old man, he had but three years to accomplish his work. And there's a sense in which he could push beyond limits that would be reasonable and right for us. Think about that. It was a number of years before I was willing to think along those lines, but I do believe it is something worthy of our consideration. And then you have in your notes a very helpful article called The Pastor in His Pastime, and I trust you will find that profitable. And then number eight, beware of stubborn refusal to listen to others and there I mean others who see the signs of our becoming frayed physically and emotionally. And there I have listed or put in your, uh, with your notes what's called the Solemn Covenant of Kilburnie Place. And I've indicated in the note at the top of that uh, printed material that this was drawn up by a man who's now in heaven his wife was a nurse, and she saw signs that his physical problem, his heart problem was increasing, that he ought to get to a doctor, and he refused and refused until a heart attack landed him there, after which he drew up this document, some of it's tongue-in-cheek, but it was serious. It is hereby declared most definitely, dogmatically, decidedly, and determinately that a certain mad preacher by the name of blank, to be referred to hereafter in this document as the turkey, will submit to his wife's direction in matters medical. When the aforementioned wife tells him to phone the doctor, the aforementioned turkey will do so without dispute, dissertation, deliberation, or dissent. When the doctor's office or the emergency department of the local hospital is indicated, 
the aforementioned Turkey will not denounce her with John Knox-like thunderings, oppose her with Calvinian logic, change her mind with Spurgeonic persuasion, or resist her with Athanasian obstinacy. He will, with that sweet reasonableness, indescribable meekness, and overpowering sweetness with which he has now become possessed, simply answer her, Whatever you say, dear, or it may be permitted for him to say at his wife's discretion, of course, yes, dear. To this non-negotiable, never-to-be-changed document I hereby fix my signature and agree on any occasion when the aforementioned wife deems it necessary. This document may be waving under my nose or all else failing, stuffed down my throat. Well, the spirit of that contains much wisdom. Well then, very, very quickly then, let me address, and you have them listed out in your notes, those counsels regarding the emotional health of the man of God. The first, beware of unnaturalness and ministerial stoicism. Brothers, God has made us with emotional pores, which like our physical pores, that keep our body ventilated. God's given us emotional pores to ventilate our emotional constitution. Such things as hearty laughter, vigorous discussion on a secular matter, playfulness with one's wife, interaction with one's children, or for a number of us, we never thought we'd get there. To think of a grandpa meant some white-haired old guy just ready to drop into the grave. And here we are, grandpas. Some of us, great grandpas. I'm a great grandpa. I blink when I think of that and say it, but that's the truth. Well, these emotional pores God's given us, good music, these are means by which our emotions can find legitimate expressions. However, some men allow their role as pastors to clog those pores. They think that there's something unspiritual about letting it be evident. Hence, they are reluctant to weep unashamedly when it's appropriate to weep, to laugh from their gut when it's appropriate to laugh heartily, to pour out their complaints to God when appropriate. I love the Psalms for this and many reasons. There's no indication God got upset when a psalmist would say, Oh Lord, have you clean forgot to be merciful? What's going on here? It doesn't make sense. You promised this and yet all looks like this. There's tremendous emotional health to be found in doing what the scripture says, pour out your heart before him. This unnatural stoicism that would choke up frank dealings with God. Honesty in your posture before the people of God. Our Lord wept openly and unashamedly. Our Lord rejoiced in a way that the gospel writers could say he rejoiced in spirit because it radiated in his countenance. Our Lord showed anger, looking round about him with anger for their hardness of heart. That full range of human emotions wonderfully manifested in our blessed Lord. And here I come back. I've mentioned it in the previous hour. I would urge you, if you've never read and pondered Warfield's essay on the emotional life of our Lord, read it periodically. Pray in that ability to be like your Savior in the full, spirit-controlled expression of all of your God-given emotions. I don't have time to read that quote from uh, Gardner Spring, but I urge you to read it. It's excellent. Second counsel, beware of social isolationism. God has made us social beings in creation. Many have the idea that uh, in the ministry, you can't establish deep, intimate, close friendships. Nonsense. 
Jesus was unashamed to choose the twelve, and from the twelve, the three, and among the three, the one who leaned upon his bosom. Paul lets the whole Greco-Roman world know where his letters circulated, Timothy is my special spiritual son. I have no man like-minded. Like a son, he served with me in the gospel. None seek just Christ and the good of his people. They all seek their own, not the things of Christ. There were a lot of red faces when that Philippian letter got circulated. Preachers who were not heretics. Paul didn't care if people said, oh, he's got his favorite, Timothy. He says, yeah, I do. You got a problem with that? And then that beautiful touch in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul says, God who comforts, is, comforts those that are cast down, comforted us how? Not by sending an angel, not by a fresh infusion of the Spirit and his ministry as comforter, one called alongside to help. He comforted us by the coming of Titus. Paul was in the dumps one day. There was a creak on the door and Titus came through the door and his heart was lifted up. Beware of social isolationism. Thirdly, beware of excessive responsibilities. Don't let people determine the will of God for you. Cultivate a wholesome domestic climate. Your home should be an emotional catharsis where there is hearty laughter, where there is open, transparent communication. I'm so thankful to God that God's given me the privilege in my lifetime of having two women with whom I can be utterly uninhibited in the expression of my emotions. God knows what a miserable wretch I'd be to live with. It's hard enough probably for some people if I didn't have the wives God was pleased to give me. One at a time, I assure you. One, <laughs> one at a time. I always have to be careful when I talk about my wives uh, and, and not give the wrong impression. And then cultivate the ability not to take yourself too seriously. People will take you so seriously you begin to look at yourself the way they do. And then you're big bad trouble. My brothers, you eat too many beans, you're going to smell like the rest of us. <laughs> Don't take yourself too seriously. It helps in so many things to keep emotional health and then cultivate a pattern of timely, wholesome, emotional diversions. Find the thing that helps emotional pressure to be bled off. For me, for years, it was putting on the headphones or sitting in front of my hi-fi and listening to some of my uh, collection of records and CDs of, of the well-trained masculine voice, Nikolai Geta ringing out a high C with all that uh, just does something to me emotionally. I can't do it anymore now. may not be able to hear that kind of music till I get to heaven. But find out what helps for you. Jack Spratt could eat no fat. His wife could eat no lean. And so betwixt them both, they licked the patter, platter clean. What works for one man won't work for another. Find out those things that are an emotional catharsis for you. All things are yours. This is God's world and you're God's child. And his gifts are there to be used to keep us in a healthy emotional frame. Well, our time is gone. I trust God will use these things in each of our lives that we may be found men in optimum physical and emotional health and vigor to the praise of our great and glorious God. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray again you would take the things we've reflected upon and whatever's had the mixture of the clay and the chaff of mere human thought, blow upon it, bring it to naught whatever's been an accurate expression of what you have revealed in your word and in general revelation. Help us, Lord, to receive it, to implement it, to the praise of your grace and to the advancement of your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.